So I really appreciate um, the, the key points that Jenny brings out. I think that those are extremely crucial to all of our students and, and even more so students from underrepresented populations. Um, we, we've always had students with financial issues. We've always had students who had um, family concerns and, and food insecurity or home um, housing insecurities, but it's even more prevalent now. We um, have shifted 100% online last, last semester, and I know that each of you worked with students the best way that, that you could to still meet requirements and hold up the integrity of, of the work and, and, and the class expectations. The reality is that we have students who live in areas who um, just may not have access to Wi-Fi, period, at all. Um, another group that I'm working with through the ACA shared that there were students who, you know, were driving 30 minutes to an hour to to have access to Wi-Fi to complete their work. That's dedication. Um, that, that's a lot of dedication for our students, and we have students who are just that dedicated. But there's a lot of factors that are playing into these students' lives that they aren't prepared to handle 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. There are things that have been put into our lives that we're not prepared to handle, and we are um, degreed adults uh, that, that should be able to manage things, and it's knocked all of us off of our feet. So, um, so again, I really appreciate what Jenny said and, and the key points for it. I just want to add a couple couple things and then go into maybe some, some ways to, to teach and, and govern your class a little bit, looking more at the trauma um, and survival that students have experienced this, these past few months and how we can be supportive in the classroom of these things. So the main thing, of course, and it's been said already, is, is we're going to hold students accountable. We are not going to give anybody a free pass. You just don't get an A because you know you registered for the class at all. That that's that's not at all what is ever going to be suggested um, in any literature by my office or anything that that's published. So not at all what is being said. So we still hold students accountable. We still maintain the integrity of our. Um, program, you know, our, again, our, our classroom, the work that needs to be done, but we do it understanding that things are really, really different. So one thing that is going to happen, we, we can't enter into this semester without addressing COVID, without addressing um, Black Lives Matter or social unrest or the protests or the rioting or looting or the policies that have changed. We, we are going to have to address those things. One thing that I want to make sure as we address those things that as faculty members, you are aware of your personal opinions and personal bias that we all have on each one of these topics. Whether or not we are for or against or on either side of the coin with any of these topics, there will be students who, who don't feel that way, um, who, who have a completely different understanding of what is actually happening right now. And that is okay. And as faculty members, as staff members, we have to be okay with folks who are disagreeing with what it is that we're saying. And we have to acknowledge and practice being okay with that um, and it's hard. It's hard because we're all very passionate about our personal belief as, as well as our students. As you prepare for these conversations, I would like for to make sure that we are very mindful, particularly as we talk about some of the social unrest, that if a student of color, particularly a black male, while their perspective is so valuable in this conversation, while their voice needs to be heard, um, it, it would you know, is so paramount. It's, it's just an unreal thing for them to be able to speak up. It is very hard and very difficult for a person of color right now to be able to express their emotions and their feelings about this topic. Um, there's lots of fear. There's lots of uncertainty. There's lots of um, distrust. There's all of those things happening. But you also have to understand that black culture is rooted in survival and trauma for 401 years. There is not a, a time that many black people are able to just sit and pause and experience and feel what is happening in the world around them. And now all of a sudden in the past month, the attention has been turned to how black people feel. 
to be able to sit and pause in my feelings and, and think about um, what's happening in the world around me means that I, I have to shut down and, and let go of uh, the trauma or, or um, the fight that, that we've been fighting in this country for 400 um, plus years. So understand that to express ourselves in, a, in an open environment that, again, might have some, some distrust, might have um, some confusion about um, the security, the safeness of, the, of this space. Do not in any instant um, push a student of color to voice their opinion if, if they do not want to. It's hard. It's very difficult. And it may be, um, again, a shyness. It may be a level of uncomfort. It may be, I'm just tired. Um, I've talked about this. I've lived this. Um, and and I, I have nothing left to say. I have nothing left to give right now. And I'm still processing what it is um, that I'm going through. So um, that, that's hard because, again, we want those voices heard. We want to make sure that other students are listening and hearing. But in time, give a student of color the opportunity to speak when they are ready, um, uh, however they're, they're ready to do that. And uh, just, just be open, just be open with that. The other thing um, that I want to make sure that we are all aware of as we go into this new teaching, in addition, again, to our personal bias and, and our being aware of um, you know, some things that we're bringing into the space and understanding, again, uh, where a black student especially may be in their ability to talk about this and, and, and to feel this. But there's other things that we can do just just in general. Um, you know, there's going to be due dates, right? I mean, think we can't just have things turned in, whatever. But some things might be more important than others to have turned in on time. As Jenny mentioned, you know, again, our students, some of them have flipped to being the primary breadwinners in their family. Some of them are now responsible for the care of um, their younger siblings in case schools or daycares are closed. Some of them are responsible for elderly grandparents or sick parents. Um, so so th things are shifting in their world. And um, Monday at 11.59, it might just not be able to happen. And so if it's something that absolutely has to be turned in because it builds upon something else, then yes, that is a firm deadline. But if it's something that has some flexibility, if it's something that um, can be turned in a few days late or, you know, throughout the semester, give students that opportunity to have some flexibility in their schedule. Give students the opportunity to take care of some things that may have come up as a priority that students have not had to deal with before. We have students who um, coming to campus while um, you know we're navigating how to make sure it's as safe as possible. They are willing to take whatever risk because this is a safe place for them. This is a secure bed, a secure roof, um, and secure and food security. And so college and, and going to class and getting things done on a deadline, while they know it's important, while it's something they're dedicated to, it may not be the number one priority right now. The other thing, um, uh, the class attendance. I know we're doing some in seat and online and, and a kind of you know a mixture of different things here for this semester. But understanding that because this life has changed so much for them, that synchronous classes may not work, um, and they may only be able to log in and watch that recording. The other thing, keeping in mind some of that financial. Um, stability or financial concerns, their access to Wi-Fi, even um, if they are able to down, to watch the video, do they have or have the time to watch the video? Do they have the bandwidth to do that at home? Is it that we need to provide uh, PowerPoints that we know they can open on, on their cell phone? So to really take an inventory of the needs of, of your students in the classroom, I think would be extremely important um, as well. The biggest thing, and Jenny talked about this as well, is getting to know your students, um, providing a space to listen, number one, um, and, and a place um, for each other, for us to learn from each other. This is the worst of times and the best of times that, that we are experiencing. There is so much happening and so much uncertainty going on right now, but at the same time, in, in the classroom, whatever that may look like, we, we create that community, we control that climate there. And we can use this um, as just a great opportunity to learn from one another and to empower our students to learn from one another. And again, to just listen, not for response, not for um, criticism, but simply listen to understand what someone else is going through.
The, to help with that, I think it is extremely important for all faculty to include an anti-racism statement or diversity, equity, and inclusion statement on your syllabus that you go over on the very first day of class before anything else is happened or is discussed, that it is not something that you just tell students to read, but it is something that you go through step by step and what that means in your classroom so that you create the space, you start holding cultivating the community that you want to have in your classroom um, for the difficult conversations, for, um, you know, the student who might say an offhand comment and, and you know, and, and how do you bring that back together? How do you bring your group back together? And if from day one you have established that this is a place with zero tolerance for disrespect, that this is a place that all people are welcome to express their p opinions respectfully, that all people from um, all races, religions, backgrounds, that Sexual orientations um, are appreciated and their and their um, opinions are welcome um, it'll help shift that a, a good bit so um, I strongly encourage everyone to have an anti-racism or diversity and equity inclusion statement on their syllabus and one of the last things that I, that I would suggest um, just some, some quick initial things that we can do as we look about uh, teaching through an equity lens um, is take an inventory of your syllabus Take an inventory of uh, the books that you are requiring uh, students to purchase, um, the required readings, the guest speakers, the movies, whatever, the TED Talks, whatever it is that you use in the classroom. Um, are we making sure that we are presenting a diverse perspective um, and diverse people? Um, in, in these presentations, in these books? Are the books that we are requiring necessary? Again, we're talking about the huge financial obligations and burdens that students are um, now being faced with as a result of um, the last couple of months. So um, just to really make sure, and you know, lack of better words, uh, the term is decolonizing your syllabus, just to ensure that your syllabus is diverse as well, that you are teaching, um, that your teaching and what you're presenting reflects the anti-racism statement, um, the goals of um, your department, you know, to just, of course, create um, the best well-rounded, fully educated students that we can. So um, I think, again, there, there's lots of other things, I'm sure, that once if we were when we are able to sit down and talk and, and dig a little deeper, um, we could come up with more, go into more details with each of these things. But just in, in initially, as you're planning for your semester, as you're navigating the online world again in the in the hybrid, you know, face to face class, how can we make sure that we are um, implementing equity in in the work that it is that we do? There's a video. Um, that I want to share with you that, that I actually enjoy watching. It's, it's 12 minutes and it's talking more about um, primarily African American students or students of color and um, first generation students. But I think that if nothing else, what has shown us over there, or what's happened rather, over the past few months is so much has been equalized. Um, people are facing. Um, People who, who are middle class people are now facing issues that have primarily affected poor um, and underrepresented populations. And we're not going to be able to differentiate as much as we, we were able to before. I think that we will see more of our students coming in from all walks of life with very similar situations. And again, many of them aligned with the concerns that first generation and underrepresented students would have. So. Um, there are a couple of good points um, made that I think that we can apply across the board as we reflect on how we teach through an equity lens, how we make sure that um, we are um, being inclusive in, in what it is that we're teaching in our practices, in our class structure, in the community that we develop. So um, let's just watch this for, it's like I said, it's about 12 minutes. Um, he's a, a assistant professor um, at Harvard and they're a college of um, education, if my mind, if my memory is, is correct. So, um, but either way, let, let's watch this and then we'll, we'll come back and have a couple of points and then um, we'll wrap up. So um, thanks so much.